the first Old Testament book that we've ever done together. And um, it was challenging, but I'm glad you guys all stuck through it. We learned a lot of history. We learned a lot about uh, the, the reason why the Old Testament is written and how it all points to Christ. And just one short little book of Haggai, which is just two chapters in history, spans about a period of about six months, I believe. We learned how that six-month period actually prepared the way for Christ to come. Today, we're talking about Christ. We're talking about Jesus. So let me ask you guys this question. Very simple, and maybe you know the answer. Maybe you don't. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What would you say if one of your friends came up to you and asked you, Hey, man, I know you go to church. Can you tell me about this Jesus? Who is Jesus? What would you say? Or what's one first thing that would come to mind? Yeah, Danielle? The Son of God. The Son of God, okay. Jesus is the Son of God. All right, what else? What else would you, might you say, Chris? He is God. He is God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was that? The Messiah. The Messiah, okay. What else, Ella? The Savior. The Savior, okay. Anything else? Who is Jesus? He was 100% human and 100% God. 100% human, 100% God. Wow, we're getting theologically deep here. That's good, Chris. What else? Your friends might be like, what? How does that, how does that work out? We can talk about that later, but what else? What else might you say if someone was to ask you, like, who is Jesus? Tell me a little bit about Jesus. What would you say? We said, we've given him titles just now, but what else might you describe to your friend? Or what else might you tell your friend? Anyone know? Yeah, Danielle? That um, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Yeah, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, right? Even your friend might know that. My guess is that most likely whatever religion your friend is or maybe not religious at all, they would probably know that Jesus died on the cross. I think that's like a world-known fact. People know that, right? They just, they just know that, right? Now, let me ask you this question. What is he like? What if your friend is like, okay, he's a savior. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He is God. He's 100% God, 100% human. He died on the cross for sins. But can you tell me what is Jesus like? What is Jesus like? What would you say? What is his personality? Or tell me a little bit about who he, what he's like. Yes, Hong. Perfect. He's perfect. Okay. That might communicate a lot, right? That he's perfect. Yes, Hong. He's humble. He's humble. Okay. He's graceful. He's graceful. Merciful. He's merciful, right? All good answers. And these are all true things. When we think about Jesus, typically our minds tend to gravitate toward the things that he has done. Specifically, we tend to think about, like Danielle said, how he died on the cross for our sins, how he rose from the grave. And even these titles like Son of God, Messiah, those are titles that um, bear witness to what he's done, okay? The Savior. Or maybe we might be reminded of stories that we've heard in the Bible about what Jesus did the ways that he's approached lepers, the ways that he's approached the crippled or the blind or the disenfranchised, the people that are in the outcast, right? The things that Jesus has done are so important to our faith and especially for our salvation. And we need to know these things. It's it's true. We need to know these things. But I want to ask you to consider this for a moment. Again, what is Jesus like? What is Jesus like? Who is this Jesus that claimed to have died on the cross for your sins? What motivated him to do any or all of the things that he did? What motivates him even now to call you to trust him? For the next couple of months, this is going to be our aim. Uh, We're going to be spending time simply getting to know Jesus. Very simple. In order to do this, we're going to be working through various chapters of a book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. Chances are, if you've come to our church on a Sunday, you have heard Pastor Rob advertise this book multiple times. Chances are, you probably have this book in your homes, right? Many of your parents have probably taken this home with them. Uh, this book is good because it, each chapter is based on a biblical verse that talks about Jesus' character. And it kind of goes really deep into that one verse. Sometimes we read one verse of the Bible and we're like, okay, yeah, I think this is what it means. But it's crazy how much one can unpack from just one verse. And uh, that's why I I thought it'd be nice to use this to give us a taste of what Jesus is like. In his introduction, he provides a good, good perspective to consider for why we are seeking to get to know Jesus. 
He says this. We are not focusing centrally on what Christ has done. We're considering who he is. The two matters, what he's done and who he is, are bound up together and indeed they're interdependent. They rely on each other, but they're distinct. He goes on to say, you might know that Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again on your behalf to rinse you clean of all your sin, but do you know his deepest heart for you? Do you live with an awareness not only of his atoning work for your sinfulness, but also for his, uh, of his longing heart amid your sinfulness? That's a question that I hope sinks into your minds and into your hearts a little bit. My hope is that as we begin to get deeper understanding of who Jesus is, we will gain a deeper understanding of and appreciation for what he has done. And in turn, my hope is that we would have even more reason to trust in him and trust in his gospel. Sometimes we hear the gospel preached every week, but we don't really know the depths of that person, that God behind that gospel. So it just is this fact that this Jewish man 2,000 years ago died for my sins. Okay. But when we begin to understand his heart for you, Jason, his heart for you, personally, that means it will enhance, it will, it will emphasize the works that he's done for you personally. All right. And that's our hope. So did you know that in all the New Testament, there is actually only one place where Jesus himself distinctly tells us what he is like. There's only one place found in the New Testament out of all the New Testament where he verbally, and it's recorded, where he says, this is what I am like. Does anyone know where that is? Only one place. Are you about to say something, Brandon? One of the gospels. One of the Gospels. He's, he's a genius. He's good. Yes, he's right. One of the Gospels. Now, just to clarify, this doesn't mean it's in Matthew. It's in Matthew. This doesn't mean, all right, hear me, guys. This doesn't mean that this is the only place that we can go to to find out what he's like. But it is a good starting point. So what does Jesus himself say that he is like? All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And let's find out. And this is the text that we're going to be spending today. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. So go ahead and find that. And I need to get that too. No, no, but it tells you what he is like. He's just saying, I am the bread of life. All right, all right. What was that, Lily? Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Two short verses. Well, three technically, right? 28, 29, 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. What color is your shirt? I think it's red. No, it's not red. Maroon. Maroon. Yeah, maroon. It's a maroon. No, ask Marcelo. He knows what maroon is, and this is not maroon. No, but how is it actually red, red? No, but maroon is his favorite color, and this is not maroon. No, it's like, it's like, it's like dark pink. All right, all right. My bad, my bad. It's burgundy, but to me, mar- maroon and burgundy are the same, but Marcelo will say no. You just disrespected his favorite color. I know, I know. But Marcelo, this is maroon. It's like wine. Ooh, he said it's wine. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, all right? 28 through 30 says this. I learned something new today too. All right, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am gentle and lowly. Verse 29, Jesus says that he is gentle and lowly in heart. Let me ask you guys this a question. When someone says, or when Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart, what does he mean by the word heart? What is the heart? G- generally speaking, before you guys try to answer, what do people usually mean when they speak about something with their heart? For example, saying things like, she left her heart out on that stage or she left her heart out on that court or he gave her his heart or some other way that you might use that word heart, right? He has a lot of heart or she has a lot of heart. Chris, what would you say? What does heart mean? My friend Jacob was playing his heart out. 
<laughs> my friend Jacob was okay. So what does that mean? It means he was putting he was putting his hundred. He was putting his hundred, right? Okay. What else? What else does it mean to? Yeah. What is what is heart? What does heart mean? Love. Love. Okay. Heart means love. Yeah, Chris. Passion. Passion. Okay. Anybody else? How? What would you say heart means? Anybody? Life. Life. Okay. And I'm not talking about your physical heart, obviously. I hope you guys all know that, right? Blood pumping. Yes. Organ. <laughs> we might be tempted to think that the heart is only about emotions, like passion and love, or what we feel, but the heart is actually a little more than that. The, the heart is the core of who we are. Your heart is what makes you, you. It is what Dane Ortland, the author of this book, says is our motivation headquarters. Our motivation headquarters. Our heart is what defines and directs us. Proverbs chapter 4, 23, a wisdom book, actually says this. Above all else, guard your heart. It means to protect your heart. For everything flows from it. So what is the heart? Simply put, it is the core of who you are. It is what drives us to make the decisions that we make. It is what motivates us to choose one way or another. And so Jesus speaking about his heart says, the core of who I am, what drives me to make the decisions that I make, what motivates me, the deepest part of who I am is that I am gentle and lowly. Now we need to pack those two words, gentle and lowly, a little bit because, yeah, for me personally, I didn't really know what that meant, right? What does Jesus mean when he says gentle and lowly? So I am gentle. What would you say? What does it mean to be gentle? Anybody know? Or anybody want to give it a shot? Chris is very gentle. Chris, he is very gentle. No. Not when he plays poison ball. (laughs) What would you say is, how would you define that word gentle? Sam? Samuel? Like careful or like caring. Careful and caring. Okay, Jake? Calm. Calm. Okay, think of someone that's very calm. I like that. What was that? Mr. Pinky. Mr. Pinky. I don't know who that is. All right, Danielle. Peaceful. Peaceful. Okay. One more. One more. Yeah, Ryan. Pinky. Pinky. Patient. That's a good one. See, what were you going to say, C? No, no, no. He's saying Pinky like Dan Chilton. Oh, yeah. Yes. If you know Dan, he is gentle. He is a gentle giant. He was here last week, but yes. Yeah, unless he's playing Super Smash. He's not gentle then. All right. By definition, to be gentle is to have a kind and tender temperament. Uh, Jesus is saying that at the core of who he is, he is kind and tender. You could even say patient, right? So Ortland writes again, Jesus is not trigger happy, not harsh. He's not reactionary, easily exasperated. He is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. When I was young with my brother, we got into a lot of trouble. My brother is six years older than I am. And when we were younger, we played a lot of sports and we played a lot of sports in our house. And when you play a lot of sports in your house, you break a lot of things. And when you break a lot of things, your mom gets really, really mad at you. And she has every reason to get mad at you. But we've, we've gone bowling in our house. Uh, that led to a whole wall mirror to be shattered. You okay, Brendan? Right, just tap his back. Get him water, get him water, get him water. <laughs> it's all right. We played baseball in our house where he pitched the beanie baby and I swung the bat and I let it go and it shattered our window. We played basketball. Everyone here has played basketball in their house, but have you ever made a hole in your wall playing basketball in your house? No, you have? Yeah. Have yeah. you made the hole the size of your body? <laughs> yeah. All bad things and all reasons for my mom to be very, very upset. And most apartments that we lived in, we never got our deposit back because if you don't know what that is, is when you start an apartment, you pay extra money in case you damage the property. And then at the end, when you leave, they can take that money to pay for all the damages. We never got that money back, okay? Because we broke everything. My mom was always angry. And whenever we would do these things, the first thing my brother would be like is, tell me a lie. We would, we would devise a lie to, 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 to tell my mom what happened so that we would get in a little less trouble, okay? But I just remember every single time her... The key would come in. You, you know when your parents, you know when your parents come home at an exact time, right? Key would come, 
my mom would open the door and I would just be so scared, so terrified about how much I would get yelled at and what my mom would do because we broke something else, right? Again, she had reasons to be mad. But every now and then, once in a while, we would break something or do something bad or sometimes one of us would be really hurt, like usually me. And my mom actually wouldn't be upset, but I would kind of be bracing myself. You guys ever get into any kind of trouble where you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so done. Like my mom is going to be so mad. My dad's going to be so mad when they get home. Or maybe your mom tells you like, oh, when dad gets home, you're in trouble or something like that. I don't know. That was like that for me. And I was so scared of my mom. But the times that she would actually come and assess the situation and see what's broken or who's bleeding and be very gentle and calm us and make sure that we're okay before taking care of the situation. Actually, that had a really big impact on my heart. I much preferred that kind of attitude of my mom than her yelling, even though we deserve both, right? We deserve the yelling. That's the kind of gentleness that Jesus has for us. Jesus is gentle in heart. This is who he is. And I wonder if some of us need to have our minds reoriented to this truth about what Jesus is like. Particularly those of us who constantly feel condemned by our own sin or some of us who have given into that same temptation over and over again. You can't seem to get over that. What we might need to understand is Jesus is gentle. He understands. He's not pointing his finger at you when he finds out about this, which he knows, but his arm is open toward you. His heart toward you is gentle so that you would accept his invitation to come to him for help, not just for the eternal consequences of sin, which is your salvation, but his heart remains gentle toward you to help change your heart's desire for that sin, which is sanctification. So that's gentle. I am lowly, he also says. Jesus says, I am lowly. That's a little harder. Like, what does it mean to be lowly? Anybody want to take a shot at this? Because I for sure have to look this up. Yeah, Tonga? Yeah, say that first word again. Humble, Humble, right? That's actually the exact Greek definition for the word lowly. Anybody else want to take a shot at what else lowly might mean or another way to put it? Lowly. What does it mean that Jesus is lowly? Yeah. Actually, that's also in other places in in, in the New Testament. Gentle is also used as lowly as well. So it's, it's sometimes interchangeable, okay? By definition, to be lowly is to be low in status or of importance. So to be unimportant essentially is what lowly means, okay? It's a little bit ironic because Jesus we know and we we hear is the king of kings, right? He's the Lord of lords. He is holy. He is the highest of highest statuses ever known to man. And like Chris said in the beginning, Jesus is God. He's the most important person to have ever walked on this planet So how can he say that he is lowly when everything about his status is not lowly at all? The common rap about famous people is that they're so unpleasant, right? You guys see the media and people that are really, really famous, not all of them, they're really cocky or they're arrogant, they're prideful. Uh, They don't take the time to stoop low to, to meet people that are not worth their time. We can't say that for every single one, but generally that's what people think of people that are really famous, right? Or maybe even in your schools, the people that are super popular or whatever, they don't give a rip about anyone that's quote unquote under them, right? As if there was some kind of system like that. Well, Jesus is not like this. Jesus is accessible. He's approachable. He's not too high and lofty and prideful to think that you can't approach him unless you're of the same status or unless you have something to offer him. He's not too important so that he would reject you because you are less important. His heart is lowly. Again, we go back to the book. Ortland writes, For all his respondent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder if you guys can think of someone in your own life. Is there a friend like this? Or is there a teacher that's like this that is just super approachable? Like you don't feel like you need to change who you are to act like anything in front of them. Some of you guys have good friends like that where you don't need to feel like you need to act like something else, right? Some of you don't. But Jesus is like that. He's approachable. For me, it's, it's Pastor Rob. Maybe you feel that about Pastor Rob or, or, or Che or some of the elders. You think like, oh, they're, they're the pastor, so I can't go up to him and talk to them, right? But I... 
I challenge you to go talk to Pastor Rob, and I, I think he will be take very high interest in you. Oftentimes, he seems very unapproachable, but over the years, as I've got to know Rob, what I've learned is that even though he's much wiser than I am, he knows the Bible much better than I am, that even though he's the pastor of our church, he's actually really lowly. I can go to him when I'm struggling and ask for his prayer. I can go to him and ask for advice. I can go to him when I'm struggling with my ministry or with this ministry, not afraid that he's going to fire me because he's also my boss. Uh, I don't have to worry about whatever I carry in, right? His door is always open. I wonder if this too is something that we need to have on our minds or minds reoriented when we think about Christ. I wonder if some of us live like we need to clean ourselves up or to be a certain type of holiness in order to feel acceptable to God. The fact that Jesus is telling you and me that he is gentle and lowly in heart should let us know that the minimum requirement for you and me is that we just come to him. We don't have to clean ourselves off. We don't have to change who we are. We can just come to him. Hear his very words in verse 28. It says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Ortland says, uh, You don't need to unburden or to collect yourself and then come to Jesus. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come to him. No payment is required. Whether you are actively working hard to crowbar your life into smoothness, which is to labor, or passively finding yourself weighed down by something outside of your control, Jesus' desire that you find rest that you come in out of the storm, even outstrips your own desire. And despite what we might think about our unworthiness or our sinfulness even, Jesus' gentle and lowly heart desires that you come to him for the rest that only he can provide for your souls. Jesus says that I will give you rest. And then in the very next verse, he says, take my yoke upon you. We need to explain this a little bit, all right? So last one, last question for you guys is, what is a yoke? Now, I'm not talking about an egg yolk. I'm talking about Y-O-K-E yolk, yolk, yolk. Yes. It's like the thing they put on the ox to like pull the thing. And it's like really heavy. Mm -hmm. It's really like hurt sometimes. It's the thing that you put on an ox in so that they can pull the thing. And it's really heavy, so it hurts sometimes. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. It's like a mill. Like the thing you go in a circle. Okay, or, yeah, okay. Everyone get that? Everyone have an idea of what that is? That is what a yoke is, right? Um, you can show a picture here. I think there's a picture. A yoke is a wooden beam that is supposed to be fitted across the neck of two animals and attached either to a cart or to a plow. And the purpose is that it allows two animals to bear equal weight. Think about it. You have two people. It's so much easier with two, right? If it's just one, a lot heavier. But two, a lot lighter. Bear equal weight in order to pull the cart or the plow and it provides direction for the animals to go. Um, if you have ever, okay, these days you say when someone is really ripped or really muscular, what do you say? He's jacked, he's jacked right? Back when we were in high school, we still say jacked, right? It's okay for me to say the word jacked, right? When we were in high school, people would say he's yoked. Anyone ever hear that? Uh, you ever hear that? No? Okay. That's kind of what it means. It means that he's like a beast. Like he can carry weight. He can pull his... He can, what is that? He can pull his, he can carry the boat, whatever. That's what it means, all right? He's going to carry the boat. Right. The, this kind seems a little strange though, right? It seems a little strange. And why it seems so strange is Jesus just told us that he would give us rest. And then to think that we have to put on this yoke, a mechanism used to pull things around that hurts sometimes. Something seems a little off here, doesn't it? Wouldn't Jesus' rest more like, wouldn't it be more like having no yoke at all? Well, we gain perspective when we understand that in this life, for all of us here, we are all yoked to something. It might not be Jesus. For a lot of us, it might not be Jesus. But the assumption in verse 28 is that we are all laboring for and we are all heavy laden with something in our lives. We're all carrying some kind of burden here. Or to use the imagery, we're all yoked to something. This is to say something is directing our paths. Something is heavy in our lives. What is that for you? What would you say that is for you? And some, this is, very, um, this is a hard concept to think about. And maybe if you haven't thought about the things that are in your life very deeply, you might not have an immediate answer. But I know that some of you guys, when I say, what is laboring? What are you laboring for? What are you heavy laboring with? I know something comes immediately to your minds. What consumes your mind 
day in and day out? What seems to rob you of your joy day in and day out? What burdens do you carry that are burning you out? Again, maybe some of us have nothing that they can think of, but we're all yoked to something. Maybe for some of us, it is the approval of others. I know that that's a huge one for me. Uh, Even our friends, we're so heavy laden by what other people think about us that every moment we are watching out for what to say or what not to say, what to look like, what not to look like, what to wear, what not to wear, even if nobody is telling you anything. It's just the opinion of others is controlling you, is putting this yoke on you to make you go in a way that you feel like you need to be something or someone that you're not. The approval of others. Maybe some of us, it's the worry about the future or worry about keeping up with others. We're we're laboring tirelessly in our jobs for the adults and some of the youth that are working or even in our schools with our schoolwork. We're worried that if we mess up, it will be the end of our future or we'll fall out of this imaginary line of people that we need to keep up with, right? Whatever you find yourselves laboring over and heavy laden with, I hope you can see that none of these yokes we put on can offer you rest for your souls. Your education cannot offer you rest for your souls. A girl that you like, a guy that you like, or anybody, friend group, whatever, my wife, they cannot offer me rest for my souls. None of these yokes can give you peace about this life and especially beyond eternity. None of the yokes we submit ourselves to are gentle and lowly and care for our souls. And Jesus comes to us to say, take my yoke. It's easy and the burden is light. And remember, this Jesus isn't just some dude. He's not just some random Jewish guy that lived 2,000 years ago, though he was Jewish and he lived 2,000 years ago. He's not just that. Jesus is the one who created you. He's the one that knows how your heart works. In fact, he designed your heart to be the way it is. He knows what is good for you, and he knows exactly which way to steer the yoke to lead you. Jesus is gentle and lowly. And remember, there's two parts to that yoke. When Jesus says, take my yoke, it's not that he's necessarily outside of that yoke. He's with you in it. And he's saying, learn from me. Watch how I do things. Read my word. See what I say. And if you obey and you follow me, it may not be the easiest life, but it will be a good life. It will be a life of peace. It will be a life of following a master who is gentle and lowly. So as the weeks go by, we'll start digging deeper into more verses that teach us about who Jesus is. Today, we learn that he is gentle and lowly. Uh, let's, Let's pray together and we can get into our small groups.